Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Live It Up. This is the show where we explore and discuss how to take your life to that next level and beyond. We cover health, wealth, relationships, and how to create a life you absolutely love. I'm your host and coach, Fletcher Ellingson. Amy will be joining us later in the show as we discuss a health topic that's relevant to everyone. So stick around for information that may help keep you in good health. And hey, do you have a question you'd like us to answer uh, on or off the air? If you do, then send it over to us at Fletcher at FletcherEllingson.com. Okay, let's get to, today, to today's email question. It says, Fletcher, I have trouble staying motivated in most areas of my life. What do you recommend? Mary S. Hey, Mary S., thanks for reaching out, reaching out for help or advice. It's a sign of strength, so just remember that. So let's see, trouble staying motivated. Well, that reminds me of something that Zig Ziglar once said. He says, people often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither, neither does bathing, and that's why we recommend it daily. So Mary, what are you doing on a daily basis to keep yourself motivated? Oh, come on, Fletcher. Every day I have to, to motivate myself? Yeah, exactly. Just like uh, what Zig says. Do you bathe every day? Yeah, probably. And why? Because you get out there in life and you get dirty, you get messed up, you get dusty, you get stained, bruised, and sweaty, right? So you go home and you clean up and you feel better, right? It's the same with motivation. It can be short-lived. So you have to look for that motivation daily. But there's a secret, and I'm going to share it with you in just a moment. It's going to explain how to easily create motivation on a daily basis and create it on demand. Pretty cool concept, huh? So let's discuss motivation and inspiration. They're quite different, and both are needed to create a fulfilling life. So what inspires people to remarkable achievements? What inspires them to author a novel or play or movie? or to create art? What inspires people to create machines that can travel into space? And what is it that inspires some people to, to create technology that the rest of society said would be impossible? Or what about seeking the presidency? Or starting a business? Or to leave a job and travel the world? What's the common answer? It's a compelling vision. These people had a vision that was so compelling that they were motivated to create the vision that they saw in their mind. It was so inspiring that they were motivated into action to set up meetings with people they may not have even known. They networked, they shared their vision, they spent their own money or asked for money, took out loans, they, they found donations, they found funding. These people worked on their vision, on that compelling vision after they got home from work, on the weekends, they wrote about it, they dreamed about it. They had a vision of something so compelling that if they could realize it, it would result in something significant. And for some, that significant result would be a better product. For some, it was an incredible company. For some, it was ultim uh, uh, ultimate power or optimal health, fulfilling relationships. For some, it was a huge sense of worth. For some, it uh, of, of these people, it was contributing to something much bigger than themselves and leaving a legacy. And for some, it would result in freedom. Freedom in the sense of liberties or justice or in the financial sense, freedom of time, ability to travel, freedom to express themselves or ex express an idea. People who are driven and seem to have a substantial amount of motivation are like that because they have substantial inspiration. You see, motivation always comes from inspiration. In other words, Mary, inspiration is the source. So Mary, find out what inspires you and you will find much longer lasting motivation. You'll find the source of motivation and you can create it then on demand. How do you do this? Well, you ask yourself, what is it that lights you up? What do you feel passionate about? What really energizes you? What do you love doing? I'll tell you what inspires me. It's connecting with people and helping them discover what's been holding them back from getting to that next level in their life. I love seeing people take on their fears and create breakthrough results. I love seeing people get excited about life and making a difference in their family and their community. I love connecting with people on that authentic, emotional, and intellectual level. 
So, what is that compelling vision that will fill up your tank of inspiration? What will be the rocket fuel that will launch you out of your chair and, and spur you on to, to dance with your fears and create that vision? What will you do with this one life you have? And by the way, you still have time. You still have time to learn, to start, to take action. You still have time to network. You've got time to make the call. You have time to take the course, read the book, ask for help, run the race, donate, make a difference. What is it that inspires you? What makes your heart sing? Find your inspiration, Mary. You can do it, and I believe in you. All right, it's time for a quick commercial break, and then we're going to be back with Amy to talk about health, because health really is the first wealth, so stick around. Hey, welcome back to Live It Up. We are here with Amy. Hello, Amy. Hello. Today we are talking about something that affects everybody, or could. We're talking about influenza. Yep. So what is influenza? Is that the flu? Because there's a lot of, uh, people seem to use that term for, to describe a lot of uh, illnesses that they experience. Yeah, people usually lump the flu in with influenza. And really, for our healthcare, we're, you know, people in the healthcare system, we mean influenza when we say the flu. But a lot of people, when they say the flu, they mean like a stomach virus or a stomach bug where they have, you know, gastrointestinal symptoms. So we don't mean that. In healthcare, we talk about the flu as influenza. And influenza is something that affects your respiratory tract, you know, your throat, your lungs, and, your, and you get body aches. And millions of people get the flu every year, and hundreds of thousands of people are hospitalized, and even tens um, tens of thousands or even more than that even uh, die r related uh, to the flu every year. So okay. it's a big deal. It's not just a stomach flu. Doctors don't use that term, stomach flu. All right. Just the general public does. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are some of the symptoms of, of influenza then? Yeah, so influenza, usually you feel really sick. People have a high fever, usually, you know, 101, 102 or higher. They have usually a headache. They have really bad body aches, have a cough. And they really feel like, they feel so sick. And then when you go to examine them, there's really nothing that you can find that's wrong on the exam. Most of the time, if they don't have anything else going on, besides the flu, their lungs will sound clear, their throat will look fine. They just feel really bad. So those are the symptoms. And usually it lasts a solid seven days if you haven't gotten the vaccine. And so you're out of work usually for a week. Okay, and uh, what do we do then to prevent that? Well, um, there's lots of things you can do to prevent it. You know, flu season starts in the fall and goes into the spring. And so when you, one thing you can do, especially really all year long, but especially during that, that time of year, when you're in a public place where you're at a school, an airport, airplane, or at the grocery store, what I usually am really conscious of myself, and I try to tell my family too, is to try not to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth until you've washed your hands after you've been in one of those places. So that's really the way that you're gonna get sick, either if someone coughs right on you, which doesn't hopefully happen very often, <laughs> not be rude, but otherwise it would be that you go to touch something and then touch your face, particularly your eyes, nose, or mouth. So really being, a, being careful of that. The other thing is if you know someone's been sick, especially if they've had um, an illness with a fever, then you really don't want to hang out with them or tell them to stay home, at least until they haven't had a fever for 24 hours. Um, so that's, a, that's something that I think a lot of people maybe downplay. They're like, ah, it's okay, I won't get it. Or you send your kid to, to uh, back to school after they feel better. But you're saying yeah. really stick to that 24 hour window. Well, 20, so really even for, and for school, kids aren't supposed to go back to school unless they have not had a fever for at least 24 hours. And usually you're most contagious in the very beginning of an illness, rather than after you've had a cough for about a week, you're probably not contagious anymore. But in those early days, you, you most likely are. So in the first couple of days, that's when you're contagious. When you've Mostly. had it for a couple of days, not so much? Well, it depends on what illness it is. But that's always, I mean, that's a good rule of thumb is in the very beginning when you're feeling the most sick is when you're the most contagious. Okay, gotcha. Um, tell us about the flu shot because these are advertised everywhere. Yeah, so the flu shot is something that we do have to get every year. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the flu vaccination can reduce illness by about 40 to 60 percent in most people if the vaccine is well matched to the virus of the year. And um, not just do they reduce illness, but they also reduce death, 
hospital admissions, ICU admissions, especially people who have immune uh, problems, they can get very sick, people over age 65, those younger than five years old, people, uh, pregnant women can get very sick from influenza, and the vaccine reduces their risk of getting sick by about 50%. Virus of the year sounds like an award. <laughs> How do they match it? Well, so they match it. Uh, well, well, first of all, the reason that you have to get one every year. Well, one is the shot hasn't really been shown. Uh, vaccines get researched, and some vaccines cause lifelong immunity or very you know decades and decades long immunity. Others don't cause that long of lasting immunity for a variety of reasons. But the other thing about influenza is it changes every year. It mutates, and so it's all, viruses are very. Um, sophisticated and they're always changing and it, and so what the researchers have to do is they sample um, viruses from across the world and then actually each country decides on their exact mix that they're going to choose but in our country you have to decide so they decide in February in the United States what the vaccine is going to be for the following fall because then the vaccine is made in chicken eggs at this point I assume in the future it will not be the case, but so it takes a long time to make enough vaccine to get ready to vaccinate potentially the whole population. So it's a pretty interesting, um, a pretty interesting process. And then when you when you do get the vaccination, then it, your body mounts this immune response with antibodies, and then it takes about two weeks for your body to have that sufficient immune antibody response to become. Um, where you could fight off the virus if your body saw it. All right, so let's talk about antibodies. What are they, and, and can you get the flu from getting the flu shot then? Yeah, because you hear that one. So antibodies, you know, I've, I've mentioned before on this show that your body is just this incredibly sophisticated machine that has so many things running in the background, and it's why I always encourage people to take care of themselves and, and because your body is doing so much. So we, as we go through our lives, our bodies are exposed to billions and billions of germs in the environment all the time, dust, things in the air, things we, you know, touch with our, our face and our mouth. And so when your body meets a new germ, it immediately creates a blueprint of that protein of that germ and it creates memory cells. And so it will mount a response in the beginning, but then there will actually be memory cells made for that specific protein. And so then in the future, if your body sees that same germ, your body's like, oh, we got this. And, and your body's able to then mount a very large response in a very short period of time, whereas before it would have had taken a while, like the two week time. Otherwise, once your body has, has already made that memory cell and, and your immune system has the memory, then it's able to mount an immune response really quickly. So that's what we call antibodies. Antibodies are these immune cells um, that show that your body has the ability to fight off the vaccine. That's the coolest, uh, that is just so cool that your body can do that. It's really cool. And that's even one of the things where they talk about kids growing up you know, in the city or in a more sterile environment versus a farm, and there's some studies on that on allergies and asthma. And part of it is because if you grow up on a farm, you're exposed to so many germs. And those, those people actually have better functioning immune systems than the ones that aren't exposed to as much. Gotcha. And the second part of the question is, can you get the flu from having the, the flu vaccine? You cannot, 100%, you cannot get the flu because the virus is dead, it's, it's killed, it's not alive, it cannot give you the flu. However, you, your body, because it does mount an immune response, you could feel slightly sick for you know maybe three days, or you have some body aches, you may feel tired, you could feel achy, and that's just your body's immune response that's generating um, those uh, memory cells. But you can't get the flu, but you could feel a little sick after getting the flu shot. Okay, wow. Good information. We are going to take a quick break. Then we're going to be back, talk a little more about influenza and uh, how to stay healthy. Hey, welcome back to Live It Up. We're talking with uh, Amy here about influenza, and I've got a few more questions for her before we go. So my other question is, can I get seasonal flu even though I got the flu vaccine? The answer is yes, unfortunately, and why? yes, right. So, um, and one thing I would say though, you you don't know for sure that it's the flu unless you get tested and someone mm. tells you it's the flu, because there are all there also are things that feel just like the flu. There's actually a code in medicine after you see someone that's influenza-like illness because it 
acts just like the flu, but it's actually not the flu. Uh -huh. So number one, you would have to know you have the flu, so you'd have to actually get tested to confirm. Okay. So a couple of things that could have happened. Number one is you maybe were exposed. You know, you know, uh, we talked about that takes two weeks to get immune after a shot. So you could have been exposed right before you got the flu shot, or just right afterwards. So that that could be a possibility. The second thing is that you may be exposed to a flu virus, a strain that was not included in the vaccine that year, or they may have gotten the vaccine. Um, mixture not as accurate, which which can happen. Um, because because uh, basically what you're saying is because it's a bit of a gamble, right? There, yeah, it there's is. a lot of guesswork that goes into it. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely some. There's also people that don't mount as good of an immune response. So younger, healthy people will mount a better immune response in um, after being exposed to a vaccine than an older person or person that has immune problems. So say you get the vaccine and you don't mount in a good enough immune immune response, then you may still get the flu. And there are people, you know, hopefully uh, what happens is that if you were exposed to the flu, you either don't get sick at all or you have a much milder case. But I know last year we definitely had people and it was a certain strain. Some of the strains were covered well last year, some weren't. And we definitely had people in the hospital with influenza and they were all, you know, over age 70 with lung problems, you know, other things going on. Okay. And I mean, it's, you can die from it, right? Oh, you can definitely die from it. You can get very sick from influenza. There was one year, several years ago now, where there were several children under age five that died and also several pregnant women that died from influenza. Okay. Yeah. Now, but, but let's say uh, I have the symptoms. I'm feeling quite ill and it's mm -hmm. a respiratory thing. I would lock you in the room. You would lock me? You would quarantine <laughs> me? Yes. But um, would I need to go to, to the doctor? Would I need to go to the clinic? Yeah, so if, so if you're young and healthy, which I would consider you on the young you know, side, yes. you know, where you're uh, not a young child and you're not over age 65 and you don't have any immune problems and you're feeling okay, you know, you're breathing okay and all that jazz, then you really should just stay home. You don't want to go into any public places. You don't want to go to the doctor's office unless you have to for some reason because you're not feeling well. So you want to stay home. You want to wash your hands. You want everyone who comes into contact with you to make sure that they're washing their hands. You could even put a mask on or have them you know, wear a mask. So you really want to limit your exposure to the public, especially uh, while you're still having body aches and fever. That's the time where you're going to be very contagious. Those are the worst, the body aches. Oh, the body aches are terrible, yeah. Is that like a for sure sign you've got influenza? It's usually, I mean, when people come in with a little bit of a cough and they don't have body aches or fever, it's not usually influenza. People usually have really bad body aches with influenza. If you're less than, if your child is less than five, what's really hard is they can't tell us that they have body aches. They can't really tell you what's going on. So they come in looking really sick with a temperature of 103 and we're not sure what's going on. And so we can test them for flu. Unfortunately, it's a nose swab is the way that we test people usually. So it's not the most comfortable thing. Or if you have lung problems, if you're over age 65, if you're not able to stay hydrated, other things that are you're concerned about, then you might want to, you know, be seen. There now, at that point, though, if you've got influenza, there's no sense in getting the shot then at that point. No, no. And then, so let's say... Not you, if it's confirmed influenza. Yeah, so there's no sense in getting it. And what will the doctor tell you then? Just go home and go to bed? Well, it depends. Um, <clears throat> there are some antiviral medications. Certain years they have been actually put on, we can only give them to certain people so there wouldn't be a shortage. <clears throat> but you can take these antiviral medicines, they're kind of like antibiotics, but they're antiviral. If you, if you catch the symptoms within two days of being sick, then it can help um, shorten the course of being sick with it and it can, um, some, it can reduce the risk of having pneumonia and hospitalization. So if you're pretty sick and you went in soon, you may get the antiviral medication or if you're a child less than five, someone over 65. Every year the CDC gives, out, gives us out different rules about who should be treated based mm -hmm. on how bad the virus is that year, how well the shot has matched up, and how much medicine we have. So say it's a bad year where the vaccine isn't being matched up, we may be asked to um, ration um, what, who we give the antiviral medication. Okay. So, but basically, I mean, what there is to do is to quarantine yourself and kind of ride it out. Yeah, and again, it usually lasts for a solid seven days. I know I just met uh, a patient who owned his own contracting business, and he always paid for his, all of his workers to get flu shots. And he felt like it really paid off because 
either mm -hmm. either they didn't get sick or if they got sick maybe they were just sick for out for like three days versus being totally out for seven days and feeling really bad and then it probably takes you another you know couple weeks before you can really feel like yourself again mm -hmm. so the vaccine is the other thing about the vaccination is it's not it's not just so you don't get sick, but it's also to prevent time loss. And so if you look at it at, as, you know, on a national level, one of the reasons I know there are people who think the, you know, vaccine company and the government are in cahoots and, and I'm not going to, you know, comment on those people's opinions on that or the data for it. I'm not familiar with it all. But anyway, that one of the reasons to get uh, people get vaccinated on a really mass um, level is to prevent time loss. Because like I mentioned, if you get influenza, you're gonna be out for one week. And that's a lot of productivity, depending on your job and where you work. So that's a, a good reason to get vaccinated is to not have time loss. The other thing I, I didn't mention was if you are someone who lives, you know, who is a daycare worker, a healthcare worker, mm. or you live with a child under age five, or you live with an elderly person who has lung problems or someone who has immune problems, then that's really important that you get vaccinated so you don't bring it home from the grocery store or someplace where you where you were. Yeah, so we have school age kids at home um, and are you, do you an advocate for them getting the flu shot? Yes, I am. Okay. I usually make sure that they get a flu shot. Okay, um, and I usually don't. I know you usually do. I always do. Yeah. And I think you never do. And would you be an advocate <laughs> to, for me to, to also get it? or? Well, I think that you're in the group of people where you wouldn't be at a high risk of having um, a serious complication from influenza. So you would be out of work for a week. Um, but because the rest of, because I'm vaccinated, I'm not super worried if you're not. It would just be that you would feel really bad and not be able to work <laughs> for seven days. And All right then I could just tell you I told you so or something. All right, well, I guess I have a decision to make coming up. Yeah. All right, uh, anything else that uh, you wanna add? Uh, no, I think that I think that's good. Okay. I think that, yeah, just it's a, it, every, you know, you can go to the CDC's website. They have a ton of information. I would highly recommend going there if you have any questions about this topic. All right, cool, thanks, Amy. All right, guys, it's time to get out there. Be a source of kindness, be a source of contribution. You have worth, you matter, and I believe in you. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.